The first scripture reading is from Psalm chapter 20, uh, so the laughing bird version. Be there for your chosen ones when trouble hits, Lord. Use the influence of your name to protect them. Send help from your sacred home and give them support from Mount Zion. Remember all they have given to you in the past and treasure the gifts they have offered up to you. Give them their heart's desire, Lord, and make all their plans come out right. Prove yourself a winner and set them cheering. Inspire them to fly your flag and chant your name. Give them all they ask for, Lord. We know you will help your chosen ones, Lord. You will reach out your hand from heaven and answer their prayers with a great victory. Some people get arrogant about their military might or the resources at their disposal. But the only thing we put our pride in, O Lord our God, is belonging to you and bearing your name. That mob is heading for disaster, but we will come out on top and stand proud. Give victory to your chosen ones, Lord. Be there for us when we call. And the second reading is from 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 15, 34, and 16, 13. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gilbeth of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry he had ever made king Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me the one I will name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peacefully? He said, peacefully, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Elab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on the appearance or the height of a stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel set out and went to Ramah. Nobody ever likes to hear the words, I told you so. Consequently, I know a lot of people who like to say, I told you so. Amen. <laughs> and of course, you know, we're being honest here, right? 
It's part of our human nature. The Germans have a word for it. Schadenfreude. German language is full of very descriptive uh, compound words. And schadenfreude is the combination of the word joy and damage. (laughs) Take five points, joy damage, right? It's a term that is used to describe the pleasure that some people take from others' pain. Saying, I told you so, is the payoff for those who practice schadenfreude. That's something, you know, there's something disturbingly satisfying about warning a person not to do something and then watching them fail. Even when we know we shouldn't say, I told you so, it slips out anyway. But as Anne Lamott often says, remember that it is better to be kind than right. For the last few weeks, we have been talking about Samuel, who is a prophet, uh, who is front and center in Israel's transformation into a loose federation of tribes to a monarchy, uh, a country that has a king. This happened around 3,100 years ago when the tribal leaders of Israel decided that they were tired of being led by judges. Now, the judges were leaders who were appointed by prophets to make sure that people were following the law of Moses. The problem was that the law of Moses prohibited Israel from having a king. God was their only true king. And the judges were there just to make sure people were in alignment with the king's agenda. But the general population, they disagreed. They wanted a king because they wanted to be like the other nations in that part of the world. So it was Samuel's job to tell the people of Israel why it was a bad idea. Because he told them, when you have a human king... You have human king problems. Human kings are motivated by power and by prestige. They'll spend all the nation's resources on armies to conquer other nations and their attempts to build an empire. So Samuel told the people of Israel, don't do it. This is a bad idea. This is the exact opposite of what the law of Moses directs us to do. Human kings are cruel, unstable, and greedy. Israel disagreed. We want a king. And because God gifted us with free will and free choice, God said, fine, you can have a king. Israel's first king was Saul. On paper, Saul seemed great. He was forged on the battlefield as a military leader. He looked like a king. He talked tough like a king. He was everything a fledgling nation could ever want in a king. But he was also selfish, arrogant, impulsive, dishonest, lacked integrity, and worst of all, he was not aligned with God. He was everything Samuel warned the people of Israel against, but the people appointed him anyway. They did not trust God. They thought their plan was better than God's plan, which if you think about it, that right there is the very definition of sin. Ask Adam and Eve how that worked out for them. Saul wasn't in power for very long before things started falling apart. And this is where it must have been tempting for Samuel to practice schadenfreude. See? Didn't I tell you people? Didn't? And, and, and of course, they're part of his people. He's, he is a citizen of Israel. But any time uh, that, that you do schadenfreude, it's you people. Didn't I tell you people? that this would happen? 
Oh, where's your, oh, we want a king to be like the other nations dance right now. But that's not what happened. See, here's the verse in this week's text that always surprises me. Takes me off guard and surprises me no matter how many times I hear it. This is verse 37 of chapter 15. Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was sorry that he made Saul king over Israel. Now that doesn't sound like schadenfreude to me. It sounds like regret. Sounds like empathy. God then told Samuel that it was time to find another king. Now this is surprising because uh, you'd think that God would say, well, let's go back to having judges again. But remember uh, what I said last week. God can redeem anything. In fact, that's what, that's what God is all about reconciling the world to God. The people wanted a king. God allowed this, but it didn't work out. Maybe the people just needed to find the right kind of king and for the right reasons. This is where Samuel comes again. He needs to help the people find the right kind of king, which is complicated because Saul was still king. Sticky situation, to be sure. Samuel is now having to be both prophet and kingmaker. But where are you going to find someone who is worthy to be king? Where is he going to find a person who isn't like Saul, but can still represent God and reflect God's values and character and lead them to be the nation that they were called to be. In today's story, Samuel, led by God, has narrowed his search down to one of the sons of Jesse, a successful farmer and sheep breeder from the little town of Bethlehem. God led Samuel to Bethlehem and told him to contact Jesse and say, Hey, I'm here to offer sacrifice to God. How about you and your family join me? Because he couldn't say, Hey, Jesse, God sent me here to choose one of your sons to replace this wacko who's sitting on Israel's throne right now. Because if he did, King Saul would hunt him down and have him killed for treason. That's what Saul did to people who opposed him. He was petty in that way. This is starting to sound like Game of Thrones, isn't it? <laughs> This is why I love the Bible. <laughs> this meeting near Bethlehem was an opportunity for Samuel to take a look at Jesse's sons and determine which one of them would be the best king. Samuel was impressed with the, with the oldest son, Eliab. Physically, he looked like someone who would be a great king. Samuel thought, yeah, I can work with this. Holy cow, people will love him. Just look at him. He just has king written all over him. But God said no. No? Why not? To which God said, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart. The heart. Right. Okay, God, you're boss. So Samuel went down the line. Abinadab, Shemaiah, Nathanel, Radai, and Ozem. And God said no to all of them. Maybe Jesse had another son who Samuel hadn't met. So Samuel asked Jesse, are these all your sons? And Jesse said, no. No, I've, I've, I've got one more. Really? Okay, where is he? Well, he's on the back 40 tending sheep. He's just a kid. Okay, can I meet him? Sure, okay. 
So Jesse sent word to his son David to come by and meet the famous prophet Samuel, who just happened to be in town. And when David arrived, Samuel noticed that he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Handsome, not Samson. Handsome. 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 In other words, he was a sunburned, good-looking kid whose defining characteristics was his great eyes. He did not look like a king. He looked like a surfer. <laughs> the oldest son, Eliab, oh my word, he looked like a king. He's tall, burly, probably had a steely eyed gaze that would strike fear into the hearts of his enemies. But God said no to him, and God said yes to the shepherd boy with the dreamy eyes. What does this say about God's idea of the perfect king for Israel? By all other nations' standards, Saul seemed like the obvious choice, but he was a disaster. So here comes Eliab. You know, Eliab seemed like a great replacement. Surely he would do a better job than Saul. But God chose David. Earthly logic says that a king needs to project strength and stature and might. But God's logic says that a king's heart is what is most important as far as characteristics go. The people of Israel needed somebody to lead them like a shepherd. So what better person to have as a king than one who tends sheep? After all, the people of Israel were prone to veer off the path and get lost. So it makes sense to have a shepherd king. As we'll see, though, David's time as king had its own set of issues, but in all of Israel's history, the reign of David was considered the pinnacle of Israel's existence. God took a flawed plan that Israel chose by an act of their own free will and made that plan work. As we pointed out last week, God is in the business of redeeming creation and reconciling God's people even when we make mistakes. Yes, we pay the price for our poor choices, but God never gives up on us and continues to provide opportunities for us to thrive. The problem that we will see throughout history, however, is that we humans make the same mistakes over and over and over again. It's like there's this cycle of brokenness, repentance, prosperity, brokenness. And over and over and over again, it just keeps repeating because we never seem to remember the lesson of the previous cycle. The lesson of Israel wanting a king is supposed to remind us that what matters most for our leaders is where their heart is. That's it. Do they have hearts that are in alignment with God, like David? Or do they have hearts that are selfish and out of alignment, like Saul? Now you'd think this would be a relatively simple lesson for God's people to learn. But the truth is that it has proven to be one of the hardest lessons in history to learn. Here's something I don't understand. Even when we see examples in the Bible of what God shows us a leader should be, we'll say, well, no, God really doesn't mean that. I mean, we need an earthly leader who will take command and strike first and get things done. We need a leader who demands and receives respect from others. We need someone who doesn't appear weak. We need someone like that crazy tyrant king over in that other nation to make it work. In other words, we don't need a shepherd. We're not sheep. We're people. People who are looking for a shepherd king are sheeple. 
oh my gosh, is that where we got that term? But you know what? Here's the deal. At some level, I understand this. In fact, I would go as far as to say that I respect it. God's ways are contradictory to the world's ways. And it stands to reason that people who aren't in alignment with God are going to believe this way and balk up against God's plan. It makes sense that people who don't follow God will reject God's criteria for a leader. I expect non-religious people to mock people of faith for believing in or supporting a God who values the way of the shepherd. Think about it. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He self-identifies as the good shepherd who will lay down his life for his sheep. It's no wonder people reject Jesus and say, you know that Sermon on the Mount stuff is a bunch of hooey with all of its blessed are the poor and love your enemies and that kind of nonsense. That doesn't work in the real world. Where I struggle the most, though, is when religious leaders reject God's criteria for an earthly leader and say, oh, God didn't really mean that. Here's a quote from a popular pastor who founded a church in Seattle, Washington, who often reimagines God as a champion of worldly values. He said, and I quote, You have been told that God is a loving, gracious, merciful, kind, compassionate, wonderful, and good sky fairy who runs a daycare in the sky and has a bucket of suckers for everyone because we're all good people. That is a lie. God looks down and says, I hate you, you are my enemy, and I will crush you. Now, see, I found a bunch of other quotes that he made about God and about Jesus, but I feel they're just too offensive to say in church. This church. It bothers me when some Christians say, we're not electing a Sunday school teacher, we're electing a leader. We need someone who can be like the other kings of the world. Yeah, but, but wait a minute. That, how can you say that? Because here in 1 Samuel, we just learned that God chose a leader who leads as God would lead, as a shepherd. My earliest experience with the Christian faith was in a church where I was taught that God loves all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. And it was... This was a very conservative church, okay? This is, where, this is my earliest uh, relationship with the church. And it was, it was there that I was taught that the book of Revelation was a blueprint for the future. And that I needed to pay close attention to the signs of the times. I was warned about an antichrist who would come to power and lead people away from God and to their destruction. My pastors would say, don't let this happen to you. Be vigilant. In fact, for your convenience, we got a checklist here. We got a checklist here so that you can recognize this antichrist when he comes along. And I'm thinking, hey, thanks. This is going to come in handy. Man, this, this Antichrist seems like a bad dude. Yes. Yes. Don't let this happen to you because this Antichrist, this person has the ability to trick people, even Christian people, even Christian leaders into believing that good looks like bad and bad looks like good. Don't be one of those people who fall for the Antichrist's laws. Okay, thank you. This list is very helpful. And I will, I will keep my eyes open. Shoot, I'll use this list as a marker in my Bible. 
Well, I went to seminary and came to believe, like many Bible scholars, that the book of Revelation is not a window into the future. It was a story of the early church trying to remain faithful under Roman persecution. But I still remembered that checklist. It was in my Bible. Keep your eyes open. Stay vigilant. Do not get left behind. And then 30-some years later, these alarm bells start going off in my head. I started remembering that checklist that my pastor gave me, and I thought, oh, shoot. Is this really happening? And I wanted to go to my pastor. I wanted to go to my old pastor and say, oh my gosh, everything on this checklist lines up. You were right. But to my surprise, my old pastor seems to have lost that checklist. What does it take for a church to be prophetic in its mission and witness? It takes one who is able to remember the lessons of the past and recognize where we are in that never-ending cycle of brokenness, repentance, prosperity, and brokenness, and then say, no more. We are not going to repeat this cycle. We are going to use these stories from God's Word, God's holy Word, to realign ourselves with God and be true to the prayer that Jesus taught us when He said, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is also in heaven. God's Word for God's people.